Good morning, everyone. I see everyone jumping on the call here, so we're going to get started today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ashley Brown, and on behalf of KLR and our affiliate companies, I wanted to welcome you to today's webinar, 2022 Year-End Tax and Business Planning. Most of you probably recognize this dynamic duo. Presenting today, we have Laura Ilanis, partner and director of our tax services group at KLR, and Anthony Mandarelli, partner and director of our enterprise solutions group. Good morning. Good morning. As we head into 2023, strategic tax planning will be crucial for all individuals, ongoing inflation concerns, the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act provisions, and post-election tax law developments will be key areas of focus for taxpayers in the new year. Business owners face similar challenges in addition to staffing shortages. And in today's webinar, Laura will dive into smart tax saving moves in light of these challenges, potential tax law developments coming in 2023, and capital investment strategy. Anthony will provide an update on the employer employee retention credit and share some strategic business planning tactics for 2023 and beyond. Just a reminder to everyone, a link to the recording of today's session will be sent via email after this session is over this afternoon. And webinar attendees will also be the first to receive a link to download our 2022 year end tax planning guide for both businesses and individuals. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And we're gonna, as, as Ashley said, we're gonna talk about some tax legislation updates, um, little that there were this year. We'll also touch upon some of the expired and expiring tax provisions that may impact your returns this year and talk about some planning opportunities. And then, uh, then Anthony's gonna tell us more about the employee retention credit, which is still around, even though uh, that ended last year, there's still some opportunities out there with, with that credit. And then um, the strategic business planning, uh, Anthony will close it up with that. And then if there's time, we'll take some questions at the end. So let's jump right into tax legislation update. There really was only one major piece of, of legislation passed in 2022, and that was the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. That was signed into law in August of 2022. And there really weren't a lot of changes that affect businesses or individuals with that, with that act. The most notable changes um, were a return of the corporate alternative minimum tax, um, for those of you that may remember with the TCJA Act in uh, 2017, that eliminated the corporate AMT entirely. However, this act brings back that, that tax regime. However, it, it's only going to be applicable to corporations, C corporations, whose uh, average annual adjusted financial statement income, this is financial statement income, not taxable income, is greater than a billion dollars. So it's not going to impact that many people, uh, that many corporations. It's really targeted at those larger corporations that have a lot of book income, but somehow manage to get that book income down to almost nothing for taxable purposes. And, and that would be a 15% corporate tax. Um, the other tax that uh, was part of that is the 1% excise tax on stock repurchases. And again, this is targeted at the larger publicly traded, these are publicly traded companies that we've seen a lot of this going on where the companies bought back shares from the public and, and basically took their took all their tax savings that they've been receiving over these last few years and, and brought the company back to being private. And so now those are, um, those stock repurchase, repurchases will be subject to a 1% excise tax. And again, it's just for companies whose stock is uh, on, a, on a published traded exchange. Uh, another notable um, provision was an increase uh, to the IRS budget. And that increase is supposed to be targeted to technology. Can't wait for that. I really think they need to update their technology because their systems do not talk well with each other. It's also going to be on enforcement and customer service. Um, 
So for those that were concerned about what that means for enforcement, uh, they are looking at increasing the audits and examinations that are, are going on right now. However, in keeping with President Biden's uh, pledge to not tax people or individuals or, or companies with income less than 400,000, Treasury Secretary Yellen did issue a mandate after this came out stating that they would not target taxpayers whose income was less than 400,000 any more than they have the historical exam rate for that group now. So that this enforcement uh, dollars are supposed to go toward the higher net worth and the bigger, the larger companies. And then lastly, there most of this bill included investments in clean energy. Some of those investments include the expansion of the residential energy credit. So prior to this act, everybody had up to an, um, a lifetime $500 uh, residential energy credit that they could take on their tax return for doing things like um, putting in new windows and doors that have insulation ratings of greater than a certain amount, um, new HVAC, energy efficient HVAC, new boilers, uh, in, insulation systems, things like that, they could get up to a lifetime $500 credit. Starting in 2023, this new, new, this new act, this new is, act now, is now, I'm sorry, if somebody is on the phone, that's not muted. That's not because muted. Because I'm getting, I'm getting, I don't know if everybody's hearing that. Everybody's hearing that. So the new credit so will the be, new credit will be $1,200. $1,200 for the same type of expenditure. And that will, that will, um, that will be an annual, be an credit. annual credit. And so, if and you are so looking, if you at are looking at type of those um, improvements in December, you may want to hold on until January because in December you're not going to get as big of a benefit for that cost as you would in in January or any time after December 2022. Okay, uh, another provision would be for the clean vehicles, and that credit is going to be extended through 2032. In addition, there is a new credit in place for used clean vehicles, and that could be up to $4,000 for a, a previously owned um, clean vehicle. Again, that's a hybrid or, or, or electric vehicle. So those are some of the um, green energy investments that will be, will be uh, get a benefit starting in 2023. Most of those provisions start in 2023. So again, not much impact to most taxpayers with this act, but um, for those of you interested in the clean energy, you may get some, some good benefits after the end of this year. Okay, the next um, piece that was passed by the House, but not by the Senate. So it isn't law yet, but it could, there is potential for it to, to pass before the end of the year. So it's the SECURE 2.0 Act, and that was passed in March earlier this year with a very large bipartisan vote of 414 to 5. Again, Senate has not voted on it yet. It hasn't come up for, for vote, and therefore it's not passed. If it there is uh, because there is such bipartisan support for it, it is possible that it could something could pass before the end of this year. Um, but the only way it's likely to pass is if it gets put into a what we call a must pass bill. For instance, um, our government funding stopgap measure ends on December 16th of 2022. Something is going to have to be passed before that date, otherwise we go into a government shutdown. And I don't think that either party is wants that to happen. So there must be some kind of a bill that will pass by that date. And parts of this bill could potentially add, get included into um, that, that uh, stopgap measure again. 
but included in this act, most notable items would be to raise the RMD age from 72, which is the, the new current RMD age, up to 75. That would be a good thing for those retirees that maybe don't absolutely need to pull their RMDs out yet. They get another three years to let it sit in that tax deferred account. They would also look at increasing those catch-up contributions into retirement plans, which now if you're over age 50, you can put a little bit more into your retirement plan than if you could pre-50. Um, they are looking at graduating those increasing amounts as you get closer to, to 65. And then the other measure would be looking at potentially making all of those catch-up contributions be more like a Roth contribution rather than a, a traditional deductible contribution. Again, Roth is an after-tax deduction. But once it's in there, once it's in the account, the, the earnings on that Roth piece would be tax-free and, and could be distributed out of the account tax-free upon retirement. So those are some of the things that were included in SECURE 2.0. Um, no way to know if those things will be included in a bill that finally gets passed. I'm sure once the Senate gets their, um, their hands on it, they, there will be some changes to it. Uh, let's see. Something to touch upon, uh, I bring up the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 because within that provision, there was an expiring um, deduction that goes that went into effect as of January 1, 2022. And that was the, the option to expense your research and development costs in the year of, um, of expenditure rather than capitalize it. That option to expense those costs as of 1-1-22 is gone. Uh, there is strong bipartisan support to change that, um, but it hasn't happened yet. So what that means is right now, the way the law is, any R&D costs, instead of expensing, must now be capitalized and amortized over a five-year period rather than expensed right away. If, if the R&D is happening overseas and it's foreign, then the amortization period is 15 years. So that certainly was meant to try to get companies to bring their R&D efforts back into the U.S. Again, there is a lot of support on both sides of, of, the, of the house to repeal this and bring back the expense, but it hasn't happened yet. Could this be part of another must-pass bill? We hope so, but um, right now we're just having to recommend to our clients that you've got to be prepared that this is this could be happening. And that means that when you're looking at, when you're, when you're recording your expenses and looking at the types of R&D costs that you may have had this year, they need to be readily um, recognizable in your accounting records so that your accountant can pull those items out of expense and capitalize them and start to amortize them according to the, the, the law. So that's, that is something that, is not not new because it was part of 2017, but it is new for it goes into effect went into effect this year. Um, some of the expired and expiring provisions that will impact most taxpayers uh, in part of the COVID relief packages that were passed enhanced and increased the child tax credit and also the dependent and dependent and child care credits. Um, for 2020 and 2021, those expi that enhanced and expanded amounts expired at the end of 21, so we're back down to the normal regular credits in 2022. Potential for that to be ex extended again. I know that the Democrats are interested in extending that, but I don't know that they'll get enough support um, from everyone to pass an extender on that, but we'll see. Another COVID uh, relief measure was for charitable donations for the non-itemizers, so those that didn't itemize their deductions. They were allowed a, uh, an, a deduction above the line for $300 for single taxpayers and $600 for married, filing joint. That expired at the end of 2021, so right now 
there is no above the line deduction for donations. Also, um, to help the restaurant industry, there were uh, in 21 and 22, if you had meals that were supplied by a restaurant, you were able to deduct 100% of those costs rather than the regular 50% of meals deduction, we were getting the benefit of 100% deduction. That ends at the end of this year, 2022. Not sure if that will extend or not, but it certainly would help the restaurant industry to keep that in place. Uh, and then lastly, the mortgage insurance premiums. Right now, uh, through the end of 2021, those mortgage insurance premiums were treated as mortgage interest. So they could be deducted as qualified mortgage interest if the taxpayer itemized. That expired at the end of 2021 again. So whether or not these will, any of these will get extended is, is time will tell. There's only, I say there's only a month to, to know, but we have seen some, some tax law changes in early January at times that were retroactive. So we'll just have to wait and see on that. The last piece of legislation is more of a state piece, and there's a lot of controversy around this and a lot of questions. So I just wanted to make sure we touched upon this, and this is the Massachusetts Millionaires Tax. Uh, that was passed by a very small margin at the, at the, by voters in Massachusetts earlier in November. And it, I think it was a 51 point, maybe 3% vote to pass it. This goes into, which means this goes into effect January 1, 2023. What this tax is, is for any taxpayer that has income over a million dollars, their rate will increase from the flat 5% Massachusetts individual tax rate to 9%, for, and that's for ordinary income and long-term capital gains. For short-term capital gains, that rate goes from 12% to 16%. So short-term capital gain income in Massachusetts has always been not good to have. And now it's now the rate is, is up to 16%, which is even worse. So there's certainly some planning that could go in around this tax um, to try to mitigate that going into effect in 2023. And some of those, I guess we can just jump into some of those planning techniques for this tax. Some of those we're advising people to accelerate income into 2022 rather than you know, normally we say push that income off to 2023 and defer the tax another year. However, if you're a Massachusetts taxpayer who might be subject to this tax, it could be beneficial for you to accelerate that income into 2022 and avoid that extra 4% tax on that income. So that's something certainly worth looking at with your tax advisor when you, while you're doing your year-end planning. There's still a month to try to make that happen. Um, one of the things that we're not sure about with this tax, because the, the guidance hasn't really been explicit, is um, if spouses file separately, do they each get a $1 million threshold or is it split so that a married filing jointly taxpayer gets a $1 million threshold? but married filing separate, each gets a million. The wording in the amendment leads us to believe that may be the case, but I don't know if that really was the intent of the legislation. So there may be some kind of a technical information release coming from MassDOR on that. But for now, it's something to consider until we hear one way or the other. Um, one, another thing that you may look at is Definitely look at your estate plan. See if there are ways to, if, if you were going to be making gifts to family members um, at some point, it might make sense to do that now if those gifts are income producing assets. Maybe push those income that income down to other family members or potentially into trusts, which right now we're not sure if trusts are subject to this tax. It looks like it is only subject to individuals, but again, that hasn't been addressed in the guidance yet. Uh, another thing, well, <laughs> one thing that everyone brings up is, should I move out of Massachusetts? Is it time to finally move to Florida or New Hampshire or one of those no state income tax states? 
And that's certainly something to consider if, if you know, if, if you were thinking about doing that. But if that is something that you decide to do, you have to make sure that you you document it well, you follow all the steps you're supposed to follow to change your residency, because Massachusetts is definitely looking at compliance with those rules. So they are stepping up their examinations to um, on residency issues. So you want to be careful of that. So I think um, those are the, the main pieces of tax legislation updates that we've uh, been looking at. Anthony, any comments or thoughts about any of those items and what you think might be happening with new legislation coming up? No, I mean, I think you did a fabulous job. I, I will tell you the, the mass millionaires tax seems to be the conversation um, I've been having over and over and over again. And you know, you bring up an excellent point about the residency because a lot of times what people don't realize is uh, when you when you change residency, it's it's not where you you're you're living. You've got to move your life there, and and there's no you know hard and fast way to say I've changed residency. It comes down to facts and circumstances, and it's not just changing your license or um, or voting. You literally have to move your life to that state, and that means having doctors, dentists. Um, other connections to that state. And so that's the conversation that always comes up with, and we've had some unhappy clients where they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, in a resident now in a state that has no state income tax. And it's like, well, not really, you know, just because you spend six months and a day there, where's your life? And it comes out to facts and circumstances. So I can't stress enough that you need to speak with, with your tax advisor as, as well as um, do the necessary uh, steps if you are going to look to make a move. Right. One of those, one of the things that um, people get surprised about, and it's certainly one of the things that the states look at, is did you keep your primary residence in the former state? Right. So some people will go and buy a little nice little condo in Florida, spend six months in a day, but they still have their six bedroom, three bath house up in, you know, near outside of Boston that they return to every year. Um, that they raise their kids in and all of their uh, treasures are in that house compared to the one in Florida. Well, you didn't change your residency. The state will absolutely ding you on that and, and say that you are still a Massachusetts resident. So once I mentioned that to some clients, they say, well, I'm not, I'm not selling my, my family home. So those are one of the things that, could there be ways to mitigate that? Maybe, but it'd have to be a really compelling reason that perhaps your children now live in that home or things like that. So um, we'll jump into some year-end tax saving opportunities. So as I mentioned, there, there wasn't a lot of tax law change this year. So it's not like there are new things that, other than the Massachusetts Millionaires Tax, it's not a lot of new things that we need to plan for. So the, the planning ideas are really kind of those tried and true um, planning techniques, which you know you want to max out on your 401k or simple IRA contributions before the end of the year. Uh, those are the types of contributions, employee contributions that you must make with your payroll, uh, rather than those IRAs and SEP IRAs for self-employed people that really can be made up until the filing date of your dead of the dead filing due date of the tax return deadline. So. The 401k, simple IRA, those are, those are some of the easiest tax saving contributions that you can make for every, especially those in the highest tax bracket. Every dollar you put into a retirement plan, you're going to save about 40 to 42 percent federal and state tax on that dollar. So it's definitely worth maximizing those contributions. One of the other things to consider is if you're making charitable donations, and you have appreciated stock in your portfolio, instead of donating cash, donate that appreciated stock. So rather than, you know, if you're going to make a $10,000 contribution to United Way, instead of cashing in some stock to get the cash, you're going to have, if you do that, you're going to have to pick up that capital gain as income. And then you may not get the full benefit of that charitable donation if you don't itemize. So you're, ta you're faced with picking up income and not really getting the benefit of the donation. 
Whereas if you just donate the appreciated stock, you have no income, you don't have to recognize the gain, and you can potentially get that benefit of the, de the, of the deduction if you do itemize. So it's always better to donate that appreciated stock rather than the cash if you have that ability to do that. The other thing is, um, you know, if you're, if you're right on the cusp of not itemizing because you don't have enough itemized deductions, you may want to consider bunching your charitable donations into one year by donating to a donor advised fund. So if you know every year you're going to donate $10,000 a year, Maybe that maybe in one year, if you have the cash available, you donate fifty thousand into this donor advised fund. You get a deduction for that fifty thousand right away, and then you still control how that money gets dispersed to the charities over the years. It's no longer in your own. You don't own those funds anymore, but you control how you can can dole out those monies and the timing of them. So that's a way to. Uh, increase your itemized deduction at least for one year and get that full benefit and then in following years you're still going to be taking that standard deduction. We also talked a little bit about the qualifying energy efficient home improvements. Again, maybe wait till 2023 to make those because the benefit could be higher then. If you are uh, if you have a high deductible health insurance plan, you should be considering a health savings account. If your employer is not contributing to one for you, you could certainly contribute to a health savings account and get a deduction for that. You don't necessarily have to use those funds in the year that they're contributed. They could continue to, um, to uh, increase, the, the earnings could increase in a tax deferred manner. And at some point, they almost act like a traditional IRA account. So it's just another way to put money into a tax deferred account. Use it for your medical expenses if you have them. But if you don't, that money can continue to grow as a deferred tax investment account. Cryptocurrency. I put that on here because the IRS is certainly looking at uh, whether or not there are cryptocurrency transactions, whether there's gains, most likely this year there's some losses that you might want to harvest, uh, given the, the environment right now. So that's certainly something that you should be talking to your financial advisor, not just cryptocurrency, but other investments. You can deduct up to a maximum of a net $3,000 loss each year. So if you do have gains and losses in your account, you might want to look at harvesting both sides of that. Um, and then lastly, you know, if you are um, of age 72 and you have to take your RMD, if you haven't taken that yet this year, consider doing a qualified charitable, dis charitable distribution. And what that does is when you make a qualified charitable distribution right from your RMD, you, the money goes directly to the charity and you're able to reduce your RMD income by that amount above the line on your tax return. So if you have an RMD for $50,000 and you donate 10 directly to a charity, your income on your tax return from that RMD will only be $40,000. So that's a good benefit right there as well. You can do up to $100,000 of a qualified charitable distribution each year. And so that's something to consider, especially for those taxpayers that, that aren't itemizing because the, the standard deduction is higher than their itemized deduction. This is definitely a way to get the benefit of your donations. I know uh, many of the brokerage firms now offer a checkbook for an IRA. So that's something certainly to look into because then you can just write checks directly out of that checking account to your charity which makes it a lot easier to do those direct contributions. And then lastly, you just want to review your withholding needs prior to taking your RMD. If you maybe are underpaid through the IRS or through your state with quarterly estimates, you might be able to do that catch up to, uh, with your withholding in order to avoid any underpayment penalties. Anthony, any other um, tax planning opportunities you think that, that should be added on to this? I, I think you got all of them. Okay. Um, 
And just touching upon estate and gift. So for 2022, the estate tax exemption is, is 12 million 60,000 per person. And then that increases to 12 million 920,000 per person in 2023. Uh, and again, that is a per person. So a married couple has up to almost 25, 26 million now in 2023 of estate value before they have to make any estate tax payments. Um, annual gift tax exclusions, back in 2021, that was 15,000. It's increased to, for inflation to 16,000 in 2022. In 2023, that increases again to 17,000. So if you're able to make those annual, gift, annual gifts, uh, I encourage you to do that before the end of the year to make them in for 2022, and then you certainly could do it again right in January 2023 at the increased amount. It's important to remember when you're making gifts, if you are paying tuition, either any type of schooling, primary, secondary, or college education, you're paying that tuition for anyone directly to the, uh, the institution, that is not considered a gift for the annual gift exclusion. It's also not, it doesn't apply against your lifetime exemption either. So those are some of the ways that, same thing with medical expenses. Those are some of the ways that, that high net worth families can reduce their estate without having to eat into their lifetime exclusion. So it's certainly something to consider if you haven't already started thinking about that. Uh, that's one of the things most financial planners, most estate planning attorneys are making their clients aware of, but I figured I would mention it here as well. And then lastly, none of the states have as high an exemption as, as the federal government does. So touch upon Rhode Island, their exemption is 1,648,611, weird number, but it just keeps increasing by a percentage amount, and that's where we got to this weird number. And then Massachusetts is actually pretty onerous. Um, there, there is no exemption. It's basically if your estate is more than $1 million, you must file an estate tax return and the full estate is subject to estate tax for, for Massachusetts. So you don't get a million dollar exemption. It's just that if your estate is less than a million, you don't have to file. If it's more than a million, you do. So that's pretty onerous that you don't even get that exemption. And that's why it's important to really plan to minimize that state burden. It's not just important to plan for the federal exemption, which most people think they don't have to plan for that because they're not gonna meet a federal estate tax, but you still have to keep in mind the state um, impact as well. And there's ways to plan for that. Um, for businesses, uh, not much there other than, you know, look at the, many of the states that now have a pass-through entity tax regime, which allowed, is most of the states are elective. It allows the businesses to pay the state income tax at the business entity level and pass that tax down as a credit to the individual owners so they can claim a credit on their personal tax return. The benefit of that is it reduces the federal taxable income by that state income tax. Whereas if the owners paid it personally, it would be an itemized deduction. And we all know about that $10,000 salt cap. So nobody really gets the benefit of paying the tax personally. Now the businesses get that, that federal deduction. So that is something worth looking at. Anthony will tell us about the employee retention credit and what's going on there. Um, still have Section 179 expense that's allowable. So if you're going to be buying equipment, um, or furnishings or anything like that, but making any capital investments, you may want to do that before the end of the year, unless of course you're an owner in a mass corporation that's gonna have a lot of income, then you may wanna push that off to next year to, to have more income this year. Um, and bonus depreciation is still at 100% for 2022. However, that is scheduled to ratchet down to 80% in 2023, so that, that's going to start going down by 20% each year after this year. Again, assuming that there's no extension or uh, provision for that. 
Um, just one last thing, be aware, a lot of people have employees working from home now, and that those are called teleworkers. And the, there's an impact to your business when you have employees working in other states. And you just need to be aware of those filing requirements. If you have an employee that's not a salesperson working in another state, that the states will see that as you having nexus in that state, and they would expect you to be um, filing as an employer in that state, which pulls you into filing income tax returns if there is an income tax in those states, um, payroll tax returns. You just want to make sure that you are aware of those rules and that you're not ignoring that. So that's what I have for the tax planning opportunities. Um, and Anthony, if you want to expand on any of that or just jump right into it, employee retention credit, I'll, I'll throw it over to you now. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. Um, I, I would, um, you know, like I say, that's all great stuff. But the one that has been a constant, I guess, point of any new client that I've brought into the firm, it seems, is um, the state and local tax issues. I can't can't stress enough that you, you really need to look at those. It's it's not the old laws of law. You physically had uh, an office in that space. Uh, there are just so many other opportunities to get caught up where you, you now have presence in the state and you need to really look at the individual state rules and we can certainly help with that. Um, but no, that was all great stuff. Um, I, I would like to um, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, I get to work with a fabulous group of people every day. I don't think people realize just how fabulous Laura is. Not only is she super knowledgeable and smart, um, she did me a solid by passing by the uh, the headshot slide so quickly because you you clearly see that she's aging backwards and I'm not. So um, um, employee retention credit, why, why are we still talking about this two years later? Because uh, it is probably the number one inquiry we still receive. And I'll tell you why. It's because every business in America seems to have received solicitations that say um, you are eligible for the, the employee retention credit. You could be getting $26,000 per employee. Um, I think my neighbor's dog actually even received notification, but I equivalent to the you might be a winner type um, mailings that you get. So what I will tell you is here's the major difference. We, we as a CPA firm and CPAs have a code of conduct to follow. The, uh, the puppy mills, I mean the ERC mills don't. And, and what that means is they can be very aggressive and they will take certain positions that um, may not be uh, may not hold up under IRS audit. And the IRS is aware of this. They've actually published um, a notification warning employers to be aware of companies promoting these services. And, and um, they then went a step further and actually provided a, a way for folks to um, provide questionable ERC mills, contact information directly to the, the IRS through a Form 3949A. So this is a, this is a major issue where you've got a lot of companies applying for the employee retention credit that may not technically be eligible. Um, and, and we have had some clients um, not happy with our positions, but you know, one of the things that Laura uh, mentioned was there was gonna be 87,000 new auditors uh, enforcement coming in the future with some of that funding. So I, I think they're gonna look at, at the ERC really hard and fast. So um, we got a lot of new things on this, but just some housekeeping, some old things on the ERC. As a friendly reminder, introduced as part of the CARE as part of the CARES Act. Um, to be honest, when, when this came out, Mike Garcia and I were preparing our first webinar back in April of 2020, and we said, Who, who's gonna who's gonna, you know, what's the point of this program? Who's gonna take advantage of it? Because PPP, if you remember that, um, was a better opportunity for those afflicted businesses. Um, so what the ERC was, it was designed to provide a credit of up to $5,000 per employee on the first $10,000 of eligible wages during 2020. Um, if, if the company was subject to a shutdown or had a 50% drop in gross receipts in a calendar quarter in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, we're going to talk about that shutdown a little bit more because that, that's really the key what we're seeing. So got a little happy with the slides. Um, you know, 
so this was a 2020 thing in an unexpected move uh the erc was later extended through the quarter ended september 30th uh 2021 and there were some additional changes as well so with the erc it's important to remember 2020 and 2021 have different um rules that have to be followed but overall the uh, eligibility is you have to have a shutdown order and you have to have a gross revenue decline of 50 percent in a calendar quarter in 2020 when you compare it to the same calendar quarter of 2019. an eligibility fine print that a lot of companies miss is that you had to have um under 100 employees full-time average employees in 2019 in order to qualify for the 2020 employer retention credit whereby you paid employees that came to work and claimed the credit. If you had over 100 full-time average employees in 2019, you would only get the credit if you paid people to sit home and not work. Um, so small employers, those that had under 100 full-time employees in 2019, really should zero in on the, uh, the 2020 credit because a lot of what we've seen is those that had over 100 employees in 2019 that were uh, full-time, they actually had their employees working in, in 2020. So um, what wages are eligible? Wages paid during the shutdown period. And wages paid in a quarter where that, that gross receipts drop um, occurred and you would be continued you would continue to be eligible for the erc on employees wages um if, if you had the, the gross receipts drop through a quarter where revenue reached 80 percent in comparison to the same quarter in 2019. Um, one item that gets missed a lot is is health insurance costs if the employer paid health insurance costs on behalf of an employee uh, that is to be included as qualified wages. And I'll, I'll tell a quick story here. I had a, I had a company call up and, and he said, hey, you know, you charged me, you know, X amount of thousand dollars to do the, the employee retention credit calculation. And I was just talking to my friend and he paid his payroll company $750 and they did it and um, he, he got his, his credit. And I said, um, did they claim it on health insurance? And he said, I don't know, I'll go back and ask. And I said, well, we claimed it on health insurance and that got you probably an extra $50,000 in, in employee retention credits. He went back and spoke to his friend, and a week later we were helping his friend um, amend and, and get an additional credit. So um, how do I receive the credit, whether it's 2020 or 2021? Um, the credit is received by um, um, amending your 941 filings. and. Why we're still talking about this is that the 2020 employee retention credit uh, is available and, and open to amend your tax return, your, your payroll tax filing form 941 through April 15th of 2024. And if you're eligible for the 2021 credit, you're eligible to uh, amend your form 941 for 2021 through April 15th of 2025. So now let's move on to 2021. Um, why, why the 2021 credit is, is much more appealing is that the, the credit is now 70% of the first $10,000 in qualified wages paid per quarter per employee, and that still includes health insurance. And that gross receipt test dropped down to 20%. So if, if your 2021 uh, quarter compared to the same quarter in 2019 had a 20% gross receipt drop, uh, you're eligible for that quarter plus the corresponding quarter that follows. And the other key, we talked about that eligibility issue, is that um, now for 2021, you go back to 2019 to test your full-time average employees, and if you have under 500, you can get the credit for wages paid to employees that actually came to work in 2021. So the 2021 credit is, is really a nice credit. So by now, a lot of folks have already looked at the gross receipt drop because that's black and white, you know, to see the gross receipt drop in the calendar quarter. But where we're seeing a lot of um, noise is, is with the uh, ERC, is the shutdown orders. Everybody's saying, oh, I'm eligible because my business was impacted. And, you know, the thing with these, the shutdown orders, it can't be voluntary. It had to be a government shutdown order. 
And when we say government, that has to be a U.S. government order. So what we're hearing from some folks is that, oh, my vendor in China was shut down because, you know, China shut down the, the businesses. It doesn't qualify. It's got to be a U.S. company. If it's your vendor and they were shut down and impacted your business, you might be eligible for the credit. If your business was forced to partially shut down, you might be eligible for the credit. If your folks work from home, that doesn't qualify. Um, you know, and some people say, okay, well, I was partially impacted. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm eligible for the credit? The key there is, you know, the IRS says, well, the shutdown order had to have more than a nominal effect on your business operations. What's a nominal effect? And 10% and is that threshold. So if you had a 10% drop in revenue um, because of a partial shutdown order in a certain business segment, you may be eligible. And I'll give you a great example. Restaurants, okay? So, so restaurants, um, you, you know, they, they increase their, call it takeout dining, but their in-person dining was, was shut down. Well, in-person dining clearly made up more than 10% of their revenues in 2019. So that partial shutdown order um, would impact restaurants. And even if they did not have the gross receipts drop, they may be eligible for the credit because um, they had a 10% drop on their in-house in, in -house dining. Now you're saying, okay, this sounds great, um, but you know, how does it impact? I took a PPP loan. Well, now you can take both, but most people are saying, well, PPP, I filed that, you know, two years ago. Um, I don't remember what I put on there. Well, the way the way I would tell you to look at it is, um, a lot of folks just put wages on the PPP when they changed the. Uh, forgiveness um, rules, a lot of people just said, oh, I, I, I had a $150,000 loan, I had $250,000 in wages, I threw that on the form. Um, does that mean I declared that 250 of wages was, was using for PPP forgiveness and I can't claim the ERC on that? And the answer is no. Um, essentially, what the IRS came out and said is that if your PPP loan was 150000 and you put $250,000 of wages on your forgiveness form, and you were eligible in that quarter, you can use that extra $100,000 in wages that you didn't need to get PPP forgiveness to claim the ERC. Additionally, if you had the non-payroll costs on your PPP forgiveness form, you can also um, use that to offset your PPP forgiveness. So if you had $150,000 loan, $25,000 in non-payroll costs, and then you put two hundred fifty dollars in wages, um, you only needed 125,000 in wages to get forgiveness on your PPP loan, so you've got 125,000 wages that could possibly be eligible for ERC. And I bring this up because, you know, there were four, four to five million uh, PPP loans that were under 150,000, and um, those folks should really be looking at the, the ERC. Um, so now the next thing we get questioned a lot is, hey, I'm eligible for ERC, but I got my PPP loan. Um, can I just say I didn't need my PPP loan in that quarter because let's say I was eligible for the ERC in Q1 of 21, but I'm not eligible in Q2 of 21. And let's say I got my PPP loan in February. Can I just say I didn't start using my PPP loan until April? Um, I, I would tell you that uh, when, you, when you signed your PPP forgiveness application as well as um, your application for the loan, it basically said current economic conditions um, make the loan necessary. So we tell people, you know, be very careful if you're going to choose that strategy because um, what happened is, you know, remember the SBA has up to six years to come back and audit your PPP forgiveness application. And recently on August 5th, 2022, President Biden signed the PPP and Bank Fraud Enforcement Harmonization Act of 2022. Say that five times fast. Um, and essentially, um, that establishes a 10-year statute of limitations for criminal charges and civil enforcement against borrowers who engage in fraud with uh, respect to their PPP loan. So in summary on the ERC, some do's and don'ts. Do speak with your tax advisor about ERC. If, if you're eligible, it's, it's a home run. Um, I, I, I mentioned, you know, we work with a lot of payroll companies. One of the things that, that I would encourage people to do is, is if you're going to claim the credit, create a workbook documenting your eligibility as well as um, the, the calculation of the credit by quarter by employee, because essentially if those 87,000 new IRS agents do start ordering you, 
it'll be several years before um, this gets looked at in some cases, and you may forget the positions that you took. Um, do optimize the ERC with PPP. Do include those health insurance costs as eligible wages. And very important, do aggregate all related parties. Um, some things don't do. Don't be aggressive with the shutdown orders. And, and I'm going to read you a section out of an engagement letter we got from a client who received it from one of those ERC mills. Um, don't claim the ERC on owner's wages or any related family members. And don't double dip on the PPP uh, forgiveness wages. So I just want to read quickly with you. Um, received this engagement letter from a client who said, you know, I, I, I KLR did not believe they were eligible for the ERC. They, they talked to a, a company. And the engagement letter says essentially, you know, essentially you will consult, uh, cons we will consult with you and guide you through the employee retention tax credit process. We will determine document eligibility in the ERC program for each quarter eligible. Um, for each eligible quarter, we will calculate credits for each employee based on eligible wages. For past eligible quarters, uh, we will prepare the amended 941 forms, and we will compile all required backup documentation and prepare a package for your records. So this is everything that they're listing out as the scope they're going to do. Uh, the billing is 15% of the credit received. And now here's all the sections that they asked our client to initial. Um, based on the eligibility criteria from the IRS and my current documentation, my business is eligible for the ERC. I will provide true and accurate documentation to the company to support this and hold the company harmless should this data be inaccurate. The company is not a certified public accountant or other accountant. You are solely responsible for seeking the advice and counsel of qualified professionals regarding your financial and accounting matters, including the eligibility and tax implications from the ERC. The company by its performance detail herein does not attest, assure, or guarantee that the ERC will be approved. We accept no responsibility for any amounts not credited under the IRS rules. And if after an audit or review, it is determined that you may not have been eligible for the ERC, uh, we will not accept any responsibility or liability for repayment of the ERC funds, penalties, or interest to the IRS or any other charges associated with this. So essentially, I read that, and I'm not an attorney, but I read that to say, um, good luck. So in, in wrap up with the ERC, it is a home run if you are eligible. We just ask, please do your due diligence. Um, so switching gears to some strategic business planning, um, just some items. I've done about, I've, the firm's done hundreds of, of deals, but I've probably been involved with about a dozen sales of companies over the last two years, and, and some things that have come up. Um, talking to business owners, they just don't know if they should buy that, buy it, another company, sell their current company, give away their current company to family members, or just run away. Um, <laughs> you know, what I can tell you is um, if you are prepping your company for sale, some of the things you need to look at is um, we talked about salt. You know, you, you got to make sure you've got all your tax filings in all the states because you don't want to get too a negotiation and find out you've got hidden issues in different states because that could take some time to remedy and it can be costly. Um, if you haven't been taking cash out of the business, the last couple of years we've had a lot of government stimulus, the balance sheets look great. Um, you know, when you go to sell your company, a buyer is going to look at that and say, well, does the company need that cash? Do they need that working capital to be um, in, operation, in operations? I would tell you, Now's the time to really work with your advisor to consider pulling some, some funds out of the business. Savings accounts are up to 3.5%. Um, so definitely look at that. If you're looking to maybe give your business away, um, have a conversation because there's different ways you can give away your non-voting shares to your family members, as Laura talked about estates, to kind of take some of the value out of your estate that is, is illiquid in your business, but you keep control, you keep the voting, um, and lastly, on valuation, you know, if you run your company for income tax avoidance, you have to remember that if you go to sell your company, um, you know, that could be an issue because a buyer may not understand that and you have to educate them, whereas public companies will, will run their business for profit maximization, whereas private companies kind of use that income tax avoidance um, as a means to, to be successful. You just, you got to be aware of that and consider that and, and have those conversations early on. Um, economic concerns, what I will tell you is that we know inflation rates 
are higher than anyone can remember. As I said, interest rates are up. Supply chain is, is getting better. It's still disrupted somewhat. Uh, we've got some companies that have been impacted by what's going on in, in Eastern Europe. Um, you've you've got to be forward thinking. You've got to make good business decisions. You've got to look at your long-term success. Um, you've got to leverage your workforce because the other thing we're hearing, I can tell you we have we have executive search group, KLR executive search, they had their best year ever last year. Even though we hear that a recession may be coming, it is still tough for any company in every industry to find talented individuals. That is still a concern we're hearing. Um, so I would tell you, if, if you can leverage technology to get more out of your existing employees, definitely look into that opportunity. Um, R&D, Laura talked about R&D earlier, but what I will tell you is R&D is not men and women in, in white lab coats. It's process improvements, it's product improvements. Have a conversation with us. That is a nice credit to get um, if you're spending dollars uh, paying people to do R&D. And, and lastly, um, I, did a, I did a webinar yesterday uh, with um, our affiliated company, Envision Technology, um, and their CEO, Todd Knapp, who's fabulous, if you don't know Todd. And, you know, something came out of the webinar that I wanted to share with you. Um, a couple numbers, uh, 14 seconds. And, and what that is, is that a cyber attack is happening every 14 seconds. Uh, $8 trillion, $8 plus trillion dollars is what is expected to be spent by the end of this year recovering from breaches in this year. $2.2 million, that is the average cost that a small or medium-sized business spends recovering from a breach. And, and this one is probably the number that blew me away the most, $1. And do you know what $1 is? That is the monthly fee it now takes somebody to su subscribe to a hacking toolkit. Apparently, these are Ponzi schemes now. These hackers will allow um, less sophisticated hackers to, to subscribe to their toolkit and go out and try and um, hack other companies, and then the head hackers get a percentage of it. So I tell you this because I had an issue happen this year where it, it's not an issue till it's an issue. I had a client call me up on a Sunday morning on my my uh, cell phone and say, I don't know how else to get to you. I don't know who to turn to. Uh, we got locked out. We're all encrypted. And these hackers are looking for um, millions of dollars to un, um, encrypt our data. I don't even know where to turn. I got Todd Knapp from Envision Technology on the phone with them within an hour on a Sunday morning, and they had a plan in place um, by, by you know Monday morning when the employees were coming in. So I tell you this because I said it's not an issue till it's an issue, but you got to take precautions on it. And I encourage everybody in 2023 to definitely look at their cyber um, uh, positions. So on to questions quickly. So, Laura, you want to take uh, some of the, the first couple of questions because they have to do with more taxes. Sure, sure. So, um, outlook on corporate and individual tax rates. Uh, I, I would say within the in the next two years, I, I think it would be very difficult for any type of tax rate change because the the House and the Senate are so divided. There's never. I don't think there will be enough bipartisan support for any type of tax rate change. Even the Democrats won't have 100% buy-in on rate changes. So I don't really see anything happening in the next couple of years. 2024 maybe may look a little different. Um, the next question, what do you think will happen with the step up in basis rules at death, if anything? Again, I don't see any change in that, especially in the next two years. And even if nothing happens with the estate tax until you know the the, the elevated rates right now are supposed to expire at the end of 2025 and then we return to the old 2010 thresholds that still had step up in basis rules so there would actually have to be some legislation passed in order to get rid of that step up in basis i don't see that happening in the next two years uh, again whatever happens in 2024 could could be different I, I did mention the 100% write-off for new equipment. It's still 100% in 2022. And in 2023, it drops to 80%, then 60, then 40, then 20. So, you know, that, that um, who knows if that 100% will get extended. Uh, you might want to take the last two, Anthony. 
Sure. Uh, uh, any changes in the soil production, oh. as we talked about, uh, use the uh, the PTE, the pasture entity tax, as a method to uh, to work around that ten thousand dollars soil production. And uh, we get this question a lot. Any way to check with the IRS and the status of our ERC? There is a one eight hundred number. I can tell you that um, the smaller credits are getting the refunds faster. Um, I can tell you, I've got some people that are still waiting. They've been on hold for for hours, and then they just hear, "Yes, we have your forms. Thank you." and um, have a good day. So there's really no good answer to that one. Um, you know, I, I think just hitting some of these other questions, um, converting your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA always makes sense. Have a conversation. If, if you've got um, some losses this year, if you're in a lower tax bracket, definitely reach out and have that conversation with your tax advisor. Um, you know, making gifts, definitely I would, I would say to, uh, Every few years, look at your estate plan, but you also need to take into account your gifting plan. Um, you want to take uh, the, the small, the QSBS 1202. I, actually, well, I'll take that one because I play a lot in the startup space. That's where you see that a lot. Um, that we don't see that changing a lot on the 1202. Uh, that was a hot topic last year, but it's kind of gone the wayside. I know I have a lot of angel investors that have asked me about that. Essentially, we don't see that going away because that would probably stop some some innovation investing. Yeah, um, the, we, we talked about where the newly authorized resources will go, so I'll skip over that one. Um, with manufacturing plants in mass in Pennsylvania, we sell product into multiple states. How can we minimize the mass millionaire tax? I will tell you, um, one thing that we don't know yet in the legislation is if non-residents of Massachusetts that have Massachusetts sourced income, are they subject to this millionaire tax? And so for those companies that have, that have mass source income, but maybe their owners are not mass residents, we're not sure yet if, if they are going to be subject to that tax. And if they are, is it going to be um, a prorated number based on their over million dollar income federally, or is it just based on their mass source income? So, those are questions still to be answered, and unfortunately, I, I, you know, other than trying to keep your income as low as possible, I don't have a good answer on, on, on that question. Um, and then lastly, any delays allowed for the RMDs due to market declines? You know, we had that issue in 2020 where people did not have to take their RMD. That hasn't happened this year, and I, I haven't heard any noise in, in. Uh, Congress that that it will. So, I think you you should plan to take your RMD this year. Um, Anthony, I'll let so you take the final thoughts. Sure. Uh, with, with that, um, you know, please allow me to thank everyone on the webinar for giving us your time and attention this morning. Uh, as we wrap up another webinar and, and year, uh, we at KOR would like to uh, thank our clients for allowing us to provide services to you and for putting your trust in us. And also would like to thank all our referral sources and friends of the firm for holding us in such high regard. You know, many of you know uh, Laura and, and myself from our work at the firm and through the community or even these webinars, which I think is our third year in a row. Um, I can tell you, we love what we do, but it would not be possible without the world-class team supporting us that make all this magic possible. And that extends not just through our team of client advisors, but through our operational support teams IT, HR, and most importantly for this webinar, marketing. Um, you know, you may be familiar with uh, Ashley, who's amazing, who opened the webinar, and she, along with our fearless uh, marketing leader, June Landry, do a remarkable job in allowing us to keep you informed through these webinars, uh, email blasts, blogs, and all of these are cataloged at our website, uh, conlitwin.com, so we encourage you to, to visit there. And uh, we would be remiss if we did not say one more time a, a big thank you to all our clients and let you know we're always looking for new clients, new opportunities, referrals. So please consider us where possible. And additionally, please remember that, you know, we're always growing and we're always looking for new talented professionals to join the firm. So if you have somebody in mind, please reach out and let us know. And uh, we look forward to discussing year in planning and, and strategies with you over the, the coming weeks and, and into 2023. I can't believe it's 2023. And uh, from all of us, please have a healthy, happy holiday season and a cautiously optimistic 2023. Uh, so please take it away, Ashley. Thank you for the kind words, Anthony and Laura. Great job today. We hope you found it helpful and informative. Um, 
We'll try to cover any questions that we received through the chat that we didn't have time to cover today in a blog, so keep an eye out for that. And as I mentioned before, all webinar attendees will be the first to receive a link in our follow-up email to our new 2022 year in tax planning guide for both businesses and individuals. So as always, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we're here to help. Thanks again and have a great day.